Today, we're reviewing the latest expansion to the world of Dungeons and Dragons. Scholar of monsters, Rudolf von Richten, has scoured through the darkest dungeons of Ravenloft, cataloging the myriad of monsters that skulk through these fog-swept lands. Ravenloft is crawling with ghouls, ghasts, and vampires, some of which could be nine feet tall. With a propensity for yeeting a vanity across the room. <clears throat> <clears throat> Sorry about that. In addition to the options for your DM, Van Richten has also given players new options, including a bard whose arts allow them to speak with spirits of departed souls, a warlock who draws their power from a master of necromancy, and a vampire race so you could play a vampire lady in a sun hat who could break me over her gosh dang knee. You know, I'm probably not the best person to review this book. Whenever a new book comes out, I just sort of skip to the parts that help me build characters either for the channel or for a player character in a campaign. If you're looking for someone who's going to review this properly, check out friends of the channel Davy Chappie or Fry Minis. They'll both be doing extensive reviews of this book. And I'll just focus on the part of the book I can review. The part that lets you make lady domestic. The part that lets you make lady domestic. Uh, I'll focus on the part of the book I can review, the part that lets you build Lady Domitresque and her huge hat in D&D. You know that really, really, really tall girl that you go to school with? Well, that's me. Let's start off with our goals for this build. First, we need to not die. Some vampires die and come back to life, but that's not you. You're the kind that turned into a vampire without the hassle of dying first. Next, nobody is calling you mommy if you don't have children, so we'll get a couple of options for a couple of daughters and some failed experimental daughters as backups. Finally, we need the Frieza technique. Switching to our final form after some podcaster-looking bastard shows up to our castle and stinks up the place. For stats, we'll be using the standard point array from the player's handbook. Roll for stats if you want, just keep your multi-classing minimums in mind. Constitution will be number one. This build isn't going to avoid getting hit. It's gonna take hits, keep walking forward, and not care. Charisma next. Obviously, it's easy to love someone with such a huge set of towers on her castle. Strength after that, you're in charge, thus you must be large. Follow that up with intelligence, you do some unethical science of your own in the basement, guess it runs in the family. Dexterity is a little low, you don't move fast, you can't jump high, but you still make Ethan die. We'll dump wisdom though, if you have weaknesses it's that you have full conversations while the dude who's invading your castle is standing right outside watching you and you don't notice. That's low passive perception. The key piece to this puzzle from Van Richten's is the Dampier race, which isn't really a race, it's a variation of races. So you could be a Dampier Goliath and be 8 feet tall, which isn't actually tall enough, but we'll get there. It takes a bit of time for the regeneration to make your bones big. It's like what the dairy industry convinced you milk does with no actual evidence. Speaking of milk, if you want to be a big woman, by your constitution and charisma with your two free points, balancing them out at 16 each. I love the new plus two in one stat, plus one in another stat, but do whatever stat you want thing that they're doing to the new races. It makes things so much more malleable so they can be flattened by Lady D. You also get 60 feet of dark vision so you can keep that gothic lighting in your castle, spider climb to move up walls without spending any extra movement, and at level three you can even hang from ceilings. You might want to climb Lady Dumatresque, but in Resident Evil 8, Lady Dumatresque climbs you. Your deathless nature means that you don't need to breathe, so heavy breathing in the room is is definitely just me then. The best part about this race is the Vampiric Bite, a natural weapon that uses your constitution modifier for attacks and damage bonuses, dealing d4 of piercing damage, and you have advantage on it when you're below half health. A d4 isn't all that great, but you can heal the amount of damage you deal with it an amount of times per day equal to your proficiency bonus or add the damage to your next ability check. So 1d4 plus 3 healing at the moment, but uh, it's gonna get silly. Like really silly. Like I didn't intend for it to be as silly as it's gonna get, but it's gonna get really silly by the end of this. I absolutely Absolutely love how this build has turned out. It doesn't work on undead or constructs, so watch out if the blood goes stale. You also get two skills of your choice. We'll go for medicine and survival, in addition to skills from the Haunted One background, like Arcana and Religion Proficiency. Mother Miranda blurs the line between priestess and witch, but you've definitely got that whole tragic backstory thing going. Everybody needs some tragedy in their backstory. We'll kick things off as a fighter, actually. I know it seems a little vanilla for a celebration of Van Richten's, but it gives you athletics and intimidation. You've got a soul, but you're not a soldier. Grab dueling for your fighting style, which might seem a bit off as well, but it adds to the damage of a weapon you're holding one-handed, or maybe made out of one hand. Maybe, we'll talk about it more later. You also get another regeneration method with second wind to heal one D10 plus your fighter level as a bonus action once per short rest. You can regenerate even when you don't turn your house guests into a Kool-Aid jammer. Use this for that. But now we need to sign up with Mother Miranda, so it's time to jump over to Warlock. As much as I'd love to make you an undead warlock to fit in with the new book, Mother Miranda 
Amanda doesn't really have an undead vibe. Minor spoilers, she does do a bit of necromancy here and there, but her aesthetic is much more witch than lich. And she has a bit of a blackbird vibe, which says Raven Queen to me, which means Hexblade. Also because the Hexblade abilities are by far the most Domitresque. First, you're a Hex Warrior, letting you pick a weapon to wield with your Charisma modifier rather than Strength or Dexterity, as long as it's not two-handed. Your claws deal slashing damage and have a nice long reach, so I think a whip would suit you well. Don't act like a whip wouldn't fit her style. They'll also get the bonus from dueling, helping you really rip open Ethan's stupid face. You can also use Hexblade's Curse, letting you pick a creature to absolutely torment for a minute, critically hitting them on a 19 or a 20. You can add your proficiency bonus to the damage of your attacks against them, and you can heal an amount equal to your Charisma modifier plus your Warlock level when you kill them. That's even more regeneration. Something I'd like to note, it's also more healing when you bite someone, since you get to heal the extra damage from your proficiency bonus. Let's take that even further with the Hex spell, cursing someone to take an extra d6 of necrotic damage from your attacks against them, which also adds to the bite damage, so you'll deal 1d4 plus 1d6 plus 5 at this point, and get between 7 and 15 health back, or that amount added to a skill check at level 2, bananas. If that wasn't enough, Hex also gives the creature disadvantage on an ability check of a certain type, strength, dexterity, constitution, intelligence, wisdom, charisma. Pick one of those and just make people worse because they're kind of pooping their pants. For your other first level spell, Wrathful Smite will add a d6 of psychic damage to your next attack and force a wisdom saving throw on a creature you hit, frightening them if they fail. For a dating sim, village can get a little scary at times. For your cantrips, Blade Ward lets you resist bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage for a round, helping you shrug off bullets as you slowly walk forward. You could dash forward instead to just get within melee range but you don't really want to try running in that dress. Infestation forces a constitution saving throw, dealing a d6 of poison damage to a creature if they fail, and forcing them to move in a random direction as you send some of your daughter's flies to handle them. It's important to work with them, show them the family business, it's not like you're going to be around forever. Wait, yes you are, that's how vampires work. Multiclassing Whiplash in a 2 lock video? I never expect it. Back over to Fighter Level 2, giving you Action Surge to let you make two actions in one turn once per short rest. Even if you've got the reach on your whip hand, the little man keeps running away from you. Maybe you do have to dash in the dress, I'm very sorry about that. Third level fighters can get bigger as a rune knight, giving you giant's might to become a size larger for a minute, get an advantage on strength checks and saves, and deal an extra d6 of damage once per round. So that bite will now deal 2d6 plus 1d4 plus 5, with between 8 and 19 healing or bonusing to an ability check. Also damage, it also deals that damage. You also get two runes, the frost rune gives you advantage on animal handling and intimidation checks, and you can add two to your strength and constitution checks for up to 10 minutes per short rest. We won't actually get to invest in our strength as much as I'd like this should make up for that a little bit. The Fire Rune lets you double your proficiency with Smith's Tools and summon Fiery Shackles that force a strength saving throw on a creature, restraining them for up to a minute if they fail, and dealing 2d6 fire damage per round until they can pass the saving throw. The fire damage isn't quite accurate, but the good lady definitely does have some shackles in her bedroom. Capcom knew what they were doing. Back over to Warlock, hopefully you don't get dizzy easily. Second level Warlocks get Invocation, special gifts for being Mother Miranda's favorite daughter, well, one of her favorite daughters. Fiendish Vigor lets you cast False Life at will, giving yourself 1d4 plus 4 temporary HP to be even thicker than you already were. Eldritch Mind gives you advantage on concentration saving throws. So far, that's just for Wrathful Smite's frightening effect, but we'll actually get some great options later. Also worth noting, since we started off as a fighter, your saving throws are strength and constitution, making you phenomenal at concentrating. For this level spell, Shield lets you add 5 to your AC as a reaction. We're mostly going to be in the take damage and not care camp, but there's nothing wrong with just stopping it from coming in altogether. Third level Warlocks get a packed boon, an extra present from your mom for reasons. I'm trying to keep it spoiler free for now, the game is still pretty new. Packed to the Blade works best for you, letting you conjure a hex weapon at will to slap your nails out with a flick of the wrist. It also makes it magical in terms of overcoming resistances, though you're just using it on Ethan, it's not like he's got thick skin. That dude loses his hands more often than I lose my glasses. You can also learn second level spells like Blur to give creatures disadvantage on their attacks against you for a minute depending on your concentration. You're a pretty big target, they're probably gonna hit you anyway, but this will just make them panic fire. Lord knows I panic fired a lot. For level warlocks, get an ability score improvement. Let's start off with constitution since that will help our bite attack and give us some more HP. Remember, the bonuses from biting are only an amount of times per day equal to your proficiency bonus, but you can still bite people every round if you want. For this level spell, Mind Spike forces a wisdom saving throw on a creature, dealing 3d8 psychic damage to those that fail, half as much to those that succeed. If they fail, they also can't hide from you for a minute, depending on your concentration. Nobody gets away from you in your castle, you're like Bowser in a sun hat. Fifth level Warlocks get another invocation, improved packed weapon will add one to your attack and damage rolls with your whip claw thingy, helping you keep it on par with your bite since we can invest in both charisma and constitution at the same time. You can also learn third 
level spells, Vampiric Touch will give you another vampire attack, letting you make a melee spell attack against a creature dealing 3d6 necrotic damage on a hit and healing you half the amount for up to a minute depending on your concentration. Honestly, Hex and your Vampire Bite might be healing more, but this is a solid backup after you burn through that. Sixth level Hex Blades get a Cursed Spectre, turning the soul of a person you killed into a Spectre with some extra temporary HP equal to your Warlock level, and you can add your Charisma modifier to its attack and damage rolls. It's under your control until you finish a long rest, it's the first of many undead you'll need for your castle. Lord knows that you don't want to maintain that big of a place by yourself. You also get another spell, and I think your daughters are more than undead, they're a bit buggy. Fey are pretty buggy, so the Summon Fey spell from Tasha's will let you summon a Fey of a certain type. Check Tasha's out for the stat block, it's a little easier for you to just read it instead of me trying to explain everything, but the main reason I'm doing this is you get a little Misty Step teleportation, which I think is perfect for disappearing and reappearing in a cloud of bugs. 7th level Warlocks get 4th level spells. Hexblades can learn Staggering Smite, letting you add 4d6 psychic damage to a weapon attack and forcing a wisdom saving throw on the creature you hit. Failing that, they get a little drained, with disadvantage on ability checks and attack rolls, and they can't take reactions until the end of their next turn. Turns out that you're actually supposed to have most of your blood inside of your body. You can also scoop up another invocation like Undying Servitude, letting you cast Animate Dead once per long rest without a spell slot. That turns a pile of bones into a skeleton or a corpse into a zombie under your control. They hang out in your basement to bully Ethan for 24 hours hours, and you can recast the spell to reassert control over up to three undead. No concentration required, so three skeletons, a specter, and a fey, you summon all at the same time. That's the Ravenloft equivalent of a bar joke. Three skeletons, a specter, and a fey walk into the bar. The bartender says, whoa, that's a straw odd assortment of characters. How have some of you not subscribed yet? Shame on you. Eighth level warlocks get another ability score improvement, bump that charisma modifier higher for your claw hand. You tend to claw more than you slurp. For this level spell, Shadow of Moil wreaths you in death energy, giving you resistance to radiant damage, and creatures who hit you with a melee attack take 2d8 necrotic damage. Try to hit the good lady with a knife, see what happens. Ninth level warlocks get 5th level spells. Dance Macabre is spelled right in the graphic, trust me, it's also a phenomenally safe password. But in D&D, it raises up to 5 corpses to work for you for an hour depending on your concentration, and they can add your spellcasting modifier to their attack and damage rolls. If you're truly a noble, you shouldn't have to do much work yourself. You also get another invocation to do more work yourself. Thirsting Blade lets you make 2 attacks instead of 1 with your action using your packed weapon. It's pretty much your best cantrip. 10th level Hexblades get Armor of Hexes, meaning that when a creature you have under your Hexblades curse tries to attack you, you can roll a d6. On a 4 or higher, they just miss. This doesn't use your reaction. There's no limit on the uses, just a full minute of the home invader missing half their attacks while you slurp them up with their necrotic straws, and recover your huge HP from your huge constitution score. Speaking of slurping, Enervation is a long-range slurp, forcing a dexterity saving throw on creatures within 60 feet of you. Failing that, they take 4d8 necrotic damage and you heal that amount. You can use your action to deal that damage again for up to a minute depending on your concentration as long as you don't do anything else. Your claw isn't actually 60 feet, but sometimes it feels like it is. I'd like to see that hitbox Capcom. I feel like I dodged it a lot more than you said I did. 11th level Warlocks get a piece of Mystic Arcanum. A 6th level spell you can cast once per long rest instead of with your spell slots which recover on a short rest. Create Undead is like Animate Dead, but it makes three corpses into ghouls which are like zombies, but better. It's just tougher fail your daughters to store in the dungeons. 12th level Warlocks get another ability score improvement let's go for charisma again since I want to get the most out of your life drinker invocation. Oh, by the way, life drinker, it's an invocation that lets you add your charisma modifier and necrotic damage to attacks with your packed weapon, so your whip is now dealing 1d4 plus 17 damage after you use Hexblade's curse, life drinker, and dueling. That's better than the great weapon master feat can do. Big woman make big hit, you have to respect it. 13th level warlocks get a 7th level mystic arcanum spell. Finger of death is pretty perfect for a woman with death fingers, forcing a constitution saving throw on a creature, dealing 7d8 plus 30 necrotic damage to those that fail, as much to those that succeed. If this kills someone, they become a zombie under your control. All the lords want winters for some reason, I think you can do better, try to get a redfield, or at the very least a Kennedy. 14th level Hexblades become Masters of Hexes, letting you move your Hexblades curse to another creature after you kill the first creature you had it on, letting you take out Claire after you take out Chris. That doesn't happen in Village. Unless you beat the game in under 3 hours on the Village of Shadows difficulty without healing or dying, then you unlock that, but you have to be a pro gamer like me. It also unlocks Chris Redfield in Smash. 15th level Warlocks get an 8th level Mystic. Arcanum spell. Glibness sets the lowest you can roll on a charisma check to 15. You're just too cool to mess up an intimidation check or a persuasion check on the rare occasion you're feeling nice. You can also grab one last invocation and Master of the Myriad of Forms is not good. It's probably the most accurate way to get a claw hand though. 
It lets you make a natural weapon that deals 1d6 damage of an appropriate type, it's magical and has plus 1 to its damage rolls. It also doesn't get any of the benefits of your packed weapon, including the extra attack. But again, it's pretty accurate, so uh, here it is. For a good one, check out Maddening Hex or Relentless Hex, but I can't explain them because they're not in character. Sorry folks, those are the rules that I made up. 16th level Warlocks get our last ability score improvement. Cap off your constitution for the best bite and enough HP to not really worry when you get hit in the face with a shotgun. Our capstone is a 17th level Warlock for one last Mystic Arcanum spell, and we need to be a monster, so we'll grab True Polymorph. That'll let you turn a creature into a different creature of challenge rating equal to their current challenge rating or level. So you could use it on yourself, and then you could turn into a creature of challenge rating 20 or lower. What would I call her final form for her final boss fight? Probably a Manticore, which is not worth a 9th level spell. But she really just flies, claws, and bites. That's what a Manticore does. To upscale to something a little bit better, a rock, spelled without a K, also flies and claws people. A Nalthesheny just claws people and flies and can frighten people, which I think is pretty reasonable. If you don't care about playing the character and just want the sauciest option, Ancient White Dragon. Go nuts. Now, True Polymorph is the main reason we had to go Warlock, other than getting your powers from an external source. Otherwise, Beast Barbarian wouldn't be a bad option. You'd get a ton of HP with the Barbarian's D12 hit die, unarmored defense to get things done with a plunging neckline, and claws and fangs to plunge into your annoying house guests. But that wouldn't get any necromancy, or the big shape shift at the end, so it doesn't work quite as well. Now that we've hit level 20, let's figure out how viable this build is. First, you are so hard to kill, with extra HP from whatever you polymorph into, followed by around 200 of your own HP, which you can heal regularly with all your spells and bites. That bite is also really solid with Hexblade's Curse, Hex, and Giant's Might. You can make your bite deal 1d4 plus 2d6 plus 11 damage for between 4 14 and 27 healing, or a bonus to a skill check six times per day. Finally, your damage is incredibly consistent, with a plus 17 damage modifier to your hex weapon for claws that really cut through your foes. For weaknesses, you might not mind taking hits, but you're gonna take a lot of them, with 15 AC if you're wearing half plate armor being your best option, and that's not in character because it would cover up your giant, uh, shoulders? Low Wisdom could also be an issue for Charming and Hold Person, first and second level spells that could stop your aggressiveness. Finally, you could use a heavy weapon with your Packed Weapon and Great Weapon Master to deal way more damage than you could with a whip. But doesn't a whip feel more right? It's not like you have to worry about dying. Enjoy your dump trucks worth of HP, plethora of regeneration skills, and final form to just destroy anyone who would threaten your family. Just watch out if you run into someone with magic of their own. They could make you look like a real boob. Thanks for watching, if you liked the video, subscribe for more, we make two videos every week. Join the Patreon for this character sheet and a whole bunch more, and sub to Davy Chappie and Fry Minis for more Van Richten content.